Hello fellow Frankensteins, I'm Pruitt and this is Jim Davis and today we are going to show you how to twist God's work into a horrible slithering abomination. It's Homebrew Monsters on WebDM. All right, Jim. Yeah. Let's craft an episode oh. about crafting homebrew monsters. Why homebrew a monster in the first place? Oh. I mean, one we of those... have the monster manual. We got Tome of oh, Bees. One, right. We've got, we've got, <laughs> we've got, we got, we got Volos. You know, I mean, we have all these books full of monsters. Full, full of, of monsters. Full of That's just from, all that. uh, yeah, for, just from Wizards of the Coast, not to from, mention all the other amazing. Yeah. So why homebrew monsters? monsters. Uh, because none of those are custom to your setting. You know, that's the, that's sort of the, the, the big one uh, for me because with, you know, the hundreds and hundreds of monsters that are out there for this edition alone, let alone other editions of D&D, plus other role-playing games in general, you still might need or want or, or, or would benefit from having monsters that are custom for your uh, setting. And if we think about it for a minute, this, this sort of idea of creating custom content for your setting is, is at the heart of, of the hobby. And, and in the early years, it was, it was much more explicit. And, and the, the game as, as written was explicitly like a, a toolkit approach. And I think a lot of the times when people complain about older editions of the game being incomplete or, or having a lot of weird rules and, and inconsistencies, they are expecting the game to be this uh, holistic, complete, and internally consistent system and not a collection of systems that you will then put together in different combinations and add your own stuff in to create the game you, you want to play. Right. And that sort of do-it-yourself uh, homebrew uh, sort of ethos is you know one of my favorite parts of the hobby, and it's a very satisfying creative outlet for a DM. You can surprise players with new monsters, particularly if you've got like veteran players who as, as much as they try to not let their uh, their ex their player experience color how they play their characters, it can't help but remember all the different things that monsters do, and, mm -hmm. and just you know they have that information. So spring a, a brand new monster on them. Those are those are the reasons why you would you would want to homebrew, and and I I, I think that that the big thing about homebrew that I see the most of we we get a lot of questions about this like how do I homebrew X X Y Z whether it's monsters, magic items, spells, uh, subclasses, the like. And the answer that I always want to give people uh, that that sometimes I worry is a little bit too flippant or dismissive is just like you just do it. There's not a trick to it. There's mm -hmm. not a, a secret. Um, now there's experience, right? There's right. there's things that you will learn as, as you uh, you know as you do more of it and you play test your creations and use them in your games. But the the idea that that number one you need some kind of special permission to do this in the first place is is, is bupkis. Forget all that. Throw that out. Yeah, you, you yeah. are the DM. That you are the only authority you need to be be concerned with. <laughs> it, it's like it, it, what it is is what you need to do to divorce yourself. It's the same thing as when you buy a mattress and it says, "Do not remove this under penalty of law." Oh, sure. You actually, uh -huh. meet those people who are like, "Well, you're not supposed to." It's like rip that tag right, rip that off. Tag right off. You bought it. You bought the mattress. Right. Sleep on it however the fuck you want. Sure, sure. You bought this game. Make the yeah. monsters that you want for it. I can imagine how if you're starting out in the hobby and you're not. Uh, you know, you don't have that that kind of benefit of, of, of say, for myself, where there was not a bunch of videos to, uh, available to watch. There wasn't a lot of uh, resources available to figure out the game, and so you do just sort of have to to just do it uh, until you <laughs> until, wing it. You wing it until uh, until it works. And and in that respect, I, I think that uh, approach is is good. But you know, you, I also have a lot of sympathy for the people who who do uh, come into the hobby, and it seems like they they seem to think that that there's uh, permission that needs to be given or or that there's some way that they can do it wrong or, or something like that and, and, and maybe there's a lot of anxieties wrapped up in it or they're worried about doing uh, their players a disservice by not uh, thinking about how they're going to homebrew their content as much as they can. Mm -hmm. um, so, but but here at WebDM, we are very much in the in the vein of don't sweat it, uh, practice makes perfect and um, that that the doing of the thing <laughs> is what we want to get to quickest. Exactly. And so we're gonna let's talk about just making some of yeah. your own monsters. Don't right? sweat it, don't regret it, and then fake it till you make it. Sure. In my this goodness. case, my, wow. we're making monsters. We're so where monsters. so where do you begin when making your own monsters? I usually begin uh, w with some kind of concept. Almost it's almost always a a, a you know an image or a theme or, or something about an antagonist, a monster. Occasionally I have a mechanic in mind. 
okay. uh, that, that I want to try out or unleash. So for instance, in 5th edition, I, I really like those mechanics that, that are about when this attack brings you to zero, X happens. Right. right. So whether you know whether it's those type of undead attacks, it's like all right, this uh, this attack hits you, make a Constitution save. Uh, if you fail, your your max hit points is like lowered by that amount, and then if you're killed by this uh, attack, you, that's it. Yeah. I like those because I think that those kind of riders on attacks are very often a way to make the game uh, deadlier and to have enemies that are really fearsome. Most of the time, it's it's a theme, it's a concept. I need a, a you know a desert stalker type animal or beast or monstrosity I and mean, occasionally it's it's more like I want to create a monster that kills characters <laughs> you yeah. know what's what's a, a good way to do that um, and so that's that's my starting point right to to either come up with a concept or a mechanical hook uh, longtime viewers will know that that's sort of how I also come up with characters <laughs> so it, there's a lot of similarity and, and overlap there at least in terms of the you know, imagining something and working through the implications of that and then figuring out how to translate that uh, vision into the mechanics of the game. So we're very often very similar uh, in that respect. With concept versus mechanics, though, does something take precedent ever with you or is it, is it just for, the, for mm -hmm. the situation you're in? Yeah. You know, okay, well, I'm going to do mechanics more this time than concept. I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, no, the concept always wins. <laughs> yeah. I might not always start there, but if you don't, have, if I don't, if I don't have a strong concept for a monster, then that means I don't have a strong idea for how I want to use them in the game. Mm -hmm. I don't have a strong idea uh, of what, you know, their place in the game world, how it influences it, how it's going to interact with the players. And it might just be more like, I kind of would like to do this little thing uh, and and very often those those kinds of monsters are not evocative they're not they're not memorable and so I try to stay away from that and wait until I have a really strong concept in mind uh, mm -hmm. to do that now I, I I have a lot of sort of criteria that I would use for for a concept or or, or you know how I might present something to me that the the first one is I, I like creating monsters that are weird and unique in yeah. some way. I really think sometimes that the, the way that modern versions of D&D are presented as like this is a, a setting in and of itself, not, not necessarily a toolkit for you to make your own stuff, but it comes with its implied setting in there and, and, and there's all this lore that's sort of already packaged in with the, the monsters and the like. You get a sense from DMs that there's an expectation that everything in the monster manual has to have a place in my world and, and is multiple copies of, right? An example of this is not, it's not the Medusa, it's the race of Medusa. Right, as opposed to the Medusa being the name of the Gorgon that is this creature, this mythological figure cursed by the gods and, mm -hmm. and guarding whatever, uh, you know, sort of uh, location that it is, and it having a lore and a mythos and, and, a, and a place that's embedded and enmeshed in your setting. It's more just like, oh, well, there's this, there's many of them. Snake haired, petrification gazed ladies are just thick on the ground in this setting. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they so, are thick. Right. <laughs> there's a lot of things about the Monster Manual where, you know, they are presenting prepackaged lore for you in case you don't want to use uh, or you don't want to have to come up with your own you just want something quick or you just want to read something and be inspired by it but thinking about monsters as these unique threats these weird sort of legendary creatures it's not a chimera it's the chimera yeah and maybe it's bigger and larger than life and does something new and different and extra uh, than, the, than the baseline uh, monster but those are the kinds of monsters that I, I really like making. That this is unique, one of a kind, and weird. Not not mm -hmm. just uh, you know the only version of X, but but a truly different kind of, mm -hmm. uh, of creature. In the same vein of starting, where where can our prospective monster makers start? As far as like <laughs> m like as far as like looking for like uh, considerations uh, in making. Monsters. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I get you. Like I mean, I think some whatever inspires you, right? Like if you're going on a, a, a you know an internet image binge and you're just looking for sort of inspirational images, or you're reading a lot of things that inspire you, taking mythological figures and, and turning them into monsters or, or other media really, and, mm -hmm. and being inspired by that, or you're taking monsters that already exist from the game and, and mix, mishing, mashing them. You know, I'm gonna mm -hmm. take. A, a dragon and a, you know, another kind of creature and like max them together. It's a dragon abolith or something like that. You a dragabolith? <laughs> you know, or uh, any other number of uh, sort of weird combinations of monsters. Maybe it's a wizard's experiment or something. Oh, yeah. Uh, right, where do you think owl bears come from, right? Yeah. Um, or, or an owl and a bear one night had a little <laughs> bit too much to drink. It was just a little yep. bit too much. Sometimes it's like a variant, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a monster in the monster manual and you're like, I, I, I like, a, I want something like this, but it's a little different. Those are 
places where I will start mm -hmm. uh, conceptually. But then once I'm ready to kind of move off that stage, I've got an idea for the monster in mind. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I've, I've maybe rolled on some random tables or something to give me an idea of its appearance, or I've, I've, I've seen something that's really gotten me my juices flowing. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. What resources do you do you delve into? What resources. I think like the the starting point that you that you would really want to consider is: Are you going to make this thing entirely from scratch, or are you going to take an existing monster and modify it? Yeah. And, and the existing monster and modify it is everything from take that monster and, and only change the name and, and how you present that monster to them to you know changing almost everything about it and you're using the base as a reference point, a starting point. Mm -hmm. And otherwise you're just gonna remake the whole thing. I don't know, you know, it, it really depends. I'm, I'm a fan of, of whatever is the least amount of effort that it's gonna take you to do. If you can reskin something, reskin it. If, if mm -hmm. giving it just like one or two extra little abilities is going to uh, make it unique, then, uh, then more power to you. Yeah. If reskinning isn't going to cut it, then is there a way to uh, just sort of like add stuff onto the monster takeaway and, and starting completely from scratch is just one of those things where, I, I mean, I, I, sometimes I do it if I need to or if I'm creating a monster that just doesn't have any any reference point uh, in a published uh, a published creature but as we said earlier there are so many monster books out there and mm -hmm. so many resources for monsters in fifth edition you probably find something to use as a base and then yeah. uh, move on from there yeah, add something take something away right. oh, I, oh I want you know uh, I want a whole like slew of like lesser angelic beings yeah, yeah it's yeah, like yeah. okay well just take like giants and give them wings and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. switch their damage type to radiant sure yeah and you got a really big angel it's, you got a really big angel Angel. Yeah, yeah. Giving a creature a fly speed, giving a creature a magical attack, allowing it to cast a, a couple of handful of spells that you never really present as like this is full on magic. It's more like they can sort of produce magical effects or yeah. have some sort of innate power. To full blown, like you're making up new abilities yourself and, and sort of presenting them uh, to the table and sort of working through that uh, playtest material and, and really going all out and using your creative output to, to make these new mechanics and these new uh, game elements that, uh, that you going to use. Um, if you're looking for guidance, if you're looking for a little uh, to make sure you're not too far outside the bounds, the Dungeon Master's Guide does have uh, some well, guidelines on how to create your uh, your own monster. They start on page uh, 273 of the Dungeon Master's Guide, sort of towards the back, and it gives advice on everything from modifying a monster, not a lot of advice there, to how to create a monster quickly using the uh, st monster t statistics by CR chart. That's the one that'll tell you, like if it's a CR2, this is sort of where its AC should be. This is yeah. about how many hit points it'll have. Here's kind of what its damage output um, will be. Moving on to that from like how to create a full on monster stat block and then um, the monster features table on page 280 is sort of like a, a big list of a lot of different types of abilities that the monsters have. It'll give you an example of, right, this is like an orc that has aggressive or, or something like that. So that you can go and look in the monster manual and sort of see what's there, but this chart is, is a, a master list of that. And I think probably that chart and the, the two charts that are there, statistics by CR and the monster features, Probably the two that I would use the most. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good time <laughs> to sort of talk a bit about CR and, and, and how it's it's not necessarily a, uh, a a good barometer for how tough a monster is. Uh, certainly not once you've gotten the idea for how the system works and what your players are like and how they play the game. But a lot of the features in the Dungeon Master's Guide do use approximate CR or anticipated CR as a way to guide your process through it. So you want to at least be familiar enough with the challenge rating and, and how it's calculated and what you do with it that um, that, that part of the monster creation process is, is you know, you at least understand it, assuming you're not just going to ignore it entirely, yeah. right? And just like, I'm going to, this, this creature has eight hit die and an AC of 13 and four attacks and you know, it, it has that because that's what I need it to have and that's what makes sense for, uh, for the mm -hmm. monster. And a lot of times just thinking through it like that, like, okay, this is a really tough beast. Like how difficult should it be to hurt? Should it be like plate mail difficult to hurt? Yeah. Or does should it, it be more like chain mail difficult yeah. to hurt? Is it really, really tough hide or does it have just normal skin? I mean, uh -huh, does uh -huh. it actually wear armor? I mean, right. Is, is it a construct? I mean, like, yeah. there's, there's a lot of considerations to take into a account yes right yes there is so let's let's let, let's let's start moving through some of those things because I mean there's quite a lot to consider 
when creating monsters like. Yeah, so I think to me that the big thing is 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 thinking through what the point of the monster is. Yeah. And and this does require a bit of metagame thinking on your part. Is the monster a big bruiser that's meant to be physically imposing and menacing to the party? They hit hard, but but maybe if you can stay out of their reach, uh, it's not going to be that uh, that difficult of a fight. Uh, or maybe they're like a mastermind type enemy that that has a lot of minions and other things that, that they control and they sit at the center of a web of intrigue and, and allies and, and, and all the like that they'll send out to the party. Well, that's going to be in a different style of monster, different abilities that they need uh, and the like. You can create sort of a monster that does a little bit of everything and is, is just sort of like, well, they're tough, they can fight, they've also got some magic, they've got some ways to manipulate things. A, a Rakshasa is something like that, where they have some magic, some ability to sort of sneak around and manipulate. They're, they're also sort of tough for, for you know the, the levels that you might introduce them and they can hit pretty hard. They're just sort of a good overall rounded out uh, kind of uh, antagonist for a mid-level party. And so thinking about that, using the monster manual as a, as a reference point, even if you're not gonna modify an existing monster, just being familiar enough with the different types of monsters, what they can do, how they're used in play, will help you understand what, what what you want out of your monsters, mm -hmm. and and will get you to that point, uh, you know, a bit smoother as opposed to just I'm gonna pick a lot of stuff either at random or or roll on some random charts and, and see if it all fits together. Having an idea in your head for the game purpose of your monster, not like the in lore or in setting lore, but uh, you know what's their function, their role in the game, mm -hmm. is a good place to. Uh, to start for those considerations because you want to talk and think about you know their abilities and how tough they are and what's their HP and how many mm -hmm. hit dice do they have and do, uh, do yeah. they do they have any weaknesses? Do they, definitely, do they have any weaknesses um, or resistances? <laughs> get resistances. Thinking about all of those things, thinking about their abilities, their weaknesses, their resistances, what their behavior is like, what a typical uh, member of this species, if you're creating like a, a you know a whole group of monsters uh, is like are, are worthwhile. I think it's kind of like a good time to mention the the monster alphabet from Goodman Games because there's a lot of Right there. Uh, right there, buddy. <laughs> right fucking there. Uh, if you are big into like homebrew and, and, and sort of like coming up with your own stuff, it's a great book full of a lot of tables and mm -hmm. inspiration and the like, and gives you a lot to sort of think about as you're homebrewing uh, your own monsters. And it's not just for uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics. You can use it for a wide variety of games, but yeah. it, it, it gives you a lot to chew on. I guess I'm kind of curious right now, like how do you come up with like sort of abilities, like what are your considerations as you're looking at uh, homebrew monsters? Proof. Well, right now, uh, you know, I'm 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 a wee a wee baby of a DM, <laughs> and so I have modified a few monsters. Uh -huh. Right. Um, it's really just like okay, I, I kind of want this. I want this monster to do this. Yes. And so yeah. you just you give it that ability. Right. Or right, I want right. you know, and I know it's not a monster, but same thing kind of with like NPCs. Sure. Right. Um, right, right. Monster you know, is a vague term here. It's yeah. Yeah. A lot of you know, if, if you if you need them to have like like that uh, like the reaction bump AC bump ability. Parry, the parry ability. The parry right, ability. Uh -huh. I give that to my 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 bandit cap. I mean, I think bandit cap actually gets that, but you, you know, can do I, it for other kind of things. Uh, but for other kind of things, like I love that one. All the abilities are out there. And so it just, it doesn't matter, just pick and choose. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, take into consideration the party that you're gonna throw this against. Um, you know, you take the action economy into, into account to mm -hmm. some degree, but I know that can be quite a lot to think about for some people, like you, you, you're not really thinking like 10 steps down, you're sure. just like, I want this bruiser in here, but yeah. like, are they fast? No? Okay, no. so they're slow. No. So they have oh, they have a high AC. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Do they have a lot of hit points? Yes. Okay. <laughs> how many hit how many times can they hit? How long will they actually stay in the fight? Right, right. Um, right. you know, these are all things to kind of consider. That's mostly what I do. I mean, I I haven't exhausted the monster manual like you have. So I'm still <laughs> like just flipping through. And like I've talked about many times, like I've just never been one of those players that when they flip through the monster manual, I don't really read what they can do. I try to not look at that. I right. like reading the lore and I like looking at the pictures and kind of getting a feel for it, but I try not to spoil myself. It's that block. And so yeah. now as a DM, when I'm flipping through and reading, I'm like, holy shit, they can do that? And you're like, <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I just never knew. You know, right. it's, a, it's all still new to me. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. you know, I'm mostly a tweaker. What I hear though, and, and uh, for first off, that's, 
perfectly fine. You can play for decades and, and you'd have never run out of uh, interesting foes to fight. But what I'm hearing is that it's it's really easy for for new for a new dungeon master to just say like, yeah, I, I, I want to change this. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of what, uh, particularly in sort of the beginning of the video we're, we're talking about is just, it, there's no trick to it. There's no nothing. You just uh, understand what you want. And a lot of this process is considering a lot, is sitting and thinking and understanding uh, the point of what you're trying to do, uh, the purpose of it, how, how do you want to use this creature? You don't have to do all that. You can just sort of be like, uh, I kind of want this creature to be a little bit tougher than the, than the toughest mm -hmm. party member, so I'll give it one more AC than the toughest party member. I'll have it a, the same hit, hit points as them, or maybe double their hit points or something. Oh, I do that all the time. Right? I, <laughs> you know? I, I, I alter hit points and AC all the time. With mm -hmm. my group, they're a bunch of badasses. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. We got a barbarian, a monk, and a cleric, and a badass rogue. Yeah. Like, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. It's almost always max hit points, and sure. I usually bump the AC by one or two. Yeah. And yeah. I might even bump the damage by a die. Like, yeah. I've done that quite a bit recently just because it's just like, I want to challenge these people. But right. I, I'm still trying to use the CR as a general just to get in the ballpark. Right. And But I have noticed it's like, no, I need to go ahead and bump almost all those things <laughs> up by a bit. And then that's, that CR works yeah. for this party. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. oh, they're all seventh level. I grab a couple of CR sevens, throw it in there, and just go ahead and juice it just a bit. Right. And they still, they have a fun fight. You know, it lasts four or five rounds, mm -hmm. six mm -hmm. rounds, and, mm -hmm. that's, and it's a fun encounter. Right. That's not, I wouldn't even count, necessarily count that as, as big modifications because, of like, the, what you're saying with the hit points, mm -hmm. you know, you have what's presented in the monster manual is just the average. So yeah. doubling it or even tripling it is sometimes still within the, uh, it's still not going to be too far outside of the bounds, but it, it, it does show how easy it is to do and, and how you don't have to do a lot to tweak the encounter and the monster enough to, to produce something memorable and unique. In terms of just sort of coming back and, and looking at the considerations that you might want for your monster, consider if it has a layer or not. Where is that layer? Where mm -hmm. is it situated? What does the layer look like? Is it a small sort of just place where they sleep? Is it an extensive complex mm -hmm. or something? What kind of environment does the layer take place in? That might help determine yep. uh, sort, of it, sort of what kind of monster it is and how it works. Does that yeah. monster have minions? Does that monster have minions? I mean, when you're home brewing the monster, it might be one of those things that, of course, they're going to have minions that come around and do its bidding, right? Right. How does it get the minions? How does it keep them around? Uh, you know, are these minions something that it can produce itself? Mm -hmm. Does it have to go and gather them? How does it convince them to stay? Uh, all of those things, answering those questions, figuring out how that works will, again, give you an idea of who your monster is, what it is that they need to do the job that you've assigned them. Mm -hmm. And and we'll, again, now we're starting to build it. We know sort of what resources they have, where they uh, where they reside. Maybe now we start thinking about the abilities that they have, not just their strength, dexterity, constitution, et cetera, but also like what sort of powers they might have. Do they have access to magic or magical items? Do they have some sort of innate ability that replicates a magical effect? And this is where you can just let your imagination run wild. And, yeah. and, and by thinking outside of mechanical terms and just thinking in concepts and effects, I want them to do this, I want them to do that, it'd be cool if this happened or if they had this sort of ability. And then translating that into the mechanics by looking at if, if it's an attack, does it impose certain conditions or does it do a combination of damage types that, that this is how it represents sort of you know, itself, my, my big giant undead ogre thing that's all full of pus and disease and whatnot might have a, a vomit attack that does acid and bludgeoning or acid and piercing. Or acid and poison. Or acid and poison or something, burns right? Burns and poisons. It burns and poisons you, but then there's all these chunky bits in it that uh, will get you. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's... <laughs> That's something to think about, okay, I'm right? Good. I'm you good. know, <laughs> find that moment between where your concept of something, what you would like to happen, becomes a game mechanic. Yeah, that can be a weird <laughs> transition from there as you sort of grapple with like, is this a condition that I'm trying to impose? Is this just a lot of damage? Is it too much damage? Too little damage? All of these things, and 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 we're talking here now about the weaknesses that the monster has, any sort of special defenses or special attacks that it might have, and 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 before we even moved on into sort of the lore of it and its motivations and, and what kind of typifies a typical member of this monster's group, all of those things, these mechanical uh, 
bits to your monster. You might feel the need to do extensive play testing on them. You might feel the need that, that for them to be perfectly balanced, for it to be this well-crafted, well-thought-out uh, thing. And that can a lot of that can happen during the game. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, you approach your players and say, hey, I made this new monster tonight. Uh, we're gonna try it out for the first time. I think it's gonna be pretty fun, but we might need to make some adjustments on the fly because this is the first time we're using yeah. it. Yeah. You know, and, and, and recognizing as a dungeon master that you might have made a big misstep and thrown something that you created against your party that can just curb stomp them. And that, that will happen occasionally <laughs> as you realize that, that your uh, perfect vision of this apex predator monster is, is maybe, too perfect. maybe too good <laughs> and, and, and you're not, uh, you know, you were not ready to follow through with, the, with what that means. You know, it, it's one thing to be like, yeah, I put this elder dragon here because I want there to be an elder dragon and you guys picked a fight with it at third level. It's another <laughs> to be like, well, you didn't necessarily know what was in there. This is a new thing. Uh, you know, we'll, we will have a bit of flexibility as we sort of play test as we go. Uh, yeah. and, and I don't know that I, I've never encountered a player who's been really upset with that. A lot of them are just fine with finding something new and unique and, and different. Oh, and, yeah, totally. You know, <laughs> but, but assuming if, there's even a fight. You know? Yeah, if if. If that scenario did play out like you explained, though, where you're like, hey, guys, we're going to do this monster, and then it destroys them, would you retcon that? I might retcon that, and I might, I might look, you know, if there's not a way to salvage it after the fact, but like, oh, it savages you and everything, but now you just wake up in its lair. Or, yeah. or it was like way, you know, way you easier. You pull Luke in the, in the ice cave. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, or if it's just bad, if it just goes bad, then the, at the first sign of that, I might tell the players, hey guys, let's just finish this fight. Let's see how it goes. And if it's, if, if it's like <laughs> devastates the party, and, and particularly if it's not an interesting or, or or relevant to what's going on in in, in the uh, in the game at the moment, uh, and doesn't produce a more interesting outcome, then maybe just say like, "Hey, tonight, guess what? We we were playing, but now we're just doing pure play testing." I, uh, okay, you know? yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. It, it might be cheesy and kind of hackney, but I would I might even do a thing like, "Oh, actually, that was an illusion." Or illusion something. He cast you know. dream on you. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> you know? there, there's any number of ways you can kind of like uh, save a a. Y'all you know, <laughs> wake up from your long rest like. <laughs> What the fuck? And turns you out had a shared dream. Right. Turns out the monster has an ability you didn't know about. Uh, <laughs> it's it's even older dreams. More. <laughs> so that and that's what it is. Play testing for stuff that you're creating only for your group. First off, I don't know how much play testing needs to be done with it, other than everyone needs to go in with an attitude of we're experimenting, we're creating, we yeah. are thinking of interesting things to do, and there might occasionally be slip ups and we we get a result that's way outside the bounds of what we want, and we'll deal with that when it comes up. Uh, it's more like an attitude of, of being open to new material, open to play testing, and, and open, open to sort of creating your own, uh, your own content there. Right, right. You've taken all these considerations in. Sure. You're making your monsters. Let's, let's, just, let's just chat about some, some monsters. Chat about some monsters? Some examples. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, you asked me, like, uh, how I do it. Jim, yeah. how do you do it? I came up with a lot of custom creatures for uh, Out of the Abyss. Yeah. So when I ran uh, Rise of Tiamat and, and sort of the back half of, of Horde of the Dragon Queen, I, I made a purposeful decision to not alter a lot, to not change things. I wanted to see how the game played without doing any of that. And sort of realized that after a certain level with the kind of game that I was running and the kind of players that I had, that I couldn't use baseline monsters. Mm -hmm in the party after about eighth or ninth level without uh, either needing to put a lot more of them on the table than I wanted to manage at one time or just had to accept the fact that, that, my, that the, the characters that were in the game that I had were, were just gonna outclass the monsters if I was using the base sort of CR guideline system. So for Out of the Abyss, I did a lot of custom monsters by creating different sorts of drow uh, mm -hmm. that were gonna pursue the party. And some of those were taking like the four original drow monsters before uh, Mordenkainen's came out. 
and and just like adding characteristics onto them that I wanted. Uh, taking a class and saying like, okay, this drow elite warrior has these abilities from say ranger or pa or a barbarian or oh, fighter yeah. or something, right? Or taking the the drow priestess and, and saying like, well, right, what what domains does Lolf have? Well, why doesn't you know, trickery? I think is uh, Lolf's domain. Why don't they have the trickery cleric abilities that you know trickery trickery cleric would have? And then sort of taking those, are they appropriate for uh, for the priestess? Can I substitute them for something else? And that was where I started with the monsters and Out of the Abyss. As, as we went along and, and the game developed its own life, moved away from the book, um, I started altering almost <coughs> altering almost everything, particularly the demons that you'd find there towards the end. I'd I'd take something like a Glabra Zoo and, and give it, you know, virtual spell levels, you know, as if it were like a really high level wizard or something. And then uh, the one that I had had two heads because it was sort of part of a cult of Demogorgon. And mm -hmm. both of the heads could each cast spells separately and can maintain concentration on separate spells because there are two different minds there. And, and then, uh, if I recall, that particular demon eluded y'all several times before you finally cornered it and mm -hmm. were able to uh, to fight it. it. I think it just like bugged out to the abyss and never came back after the last fight. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty smart with the party we had down there. I think, yeah, that was the time that I tried to take the cleric to me with the abyss. Yeah, uh -huh. or no, yeah, that was the one I tried to yeah. take the cleric uh, with me to the abyss. That didn't work out for him. It did not, it did not. He had to go running back home without a prize. But in that sense, I just took the base demon, the base Glabra Zoo, and, and, and used some of the guidelines in the DMG to add class levels to it. Um, but otherwise, if it needed to do something, if it needed a spell, uh, or if it needed an ability, if it needed something, I, I gave it to it. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted this demon to be a master manipulator and, and, and someone that was scheming and, and you know, manipulative and all that other kind of things. And so that's the, that was the abilities that, uh, mm -hmm. that I imparted to it. Um, as the campaign progressed, I, I, I came back to doing Drow when you guys assaulted uh, House Bonray and, and I was like, well, how do I simulate uh, an entire Drow house that's under attack? Required a lot of creating high level NPCs and things like that for, uh, for y'all to fight. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Doesn't matter what level they are, they all fall into a crevice created by an earthquake equally. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, the, the next big one that I made uh, was Razzle Sim. Yeah. And, and the Razzle Sim game, I, I wanted something that was more than just a night hag. I, I, I looked at the night hag and I was like, uh, you know, I, I'd asked y'all to create, uh, you know, I think it was like seventh level characters at the time, and, and I thought, my well, night hag, that's not exactly what I want. This was before Volos came out as well, so I didn't have that resource to kind of like look at for hags. And I decided that, uh, you know, using the Warlock as a base and using a lot of the uh, invocations for the Warlock uh, as special powers for uh, Razzle Sin, and then just kind of like looking at the other hags and so what did they have that I wanted Razzle Sin to have, and then as I built the campaign up and, and everything, it became uh, a matter of of looking at like, all right, I, I need the hag to do this. I, I need the hag to be able to move about this region virtually undetected and, and, and with a, a freedom of movement that the players might not initially assume that the, the hag has. Uh, and so that involved a lot of things that, that would give it enchantment type abilities, the ability to, to just go to a village and mess with the people there and, and, and cause them to, to like this kindly grandmother who, who travels from village to village. And, and gosh, she's always been around and, and, and it, just such a wonderful little person. Um, and yeah. so there was a lot of things like, oh, they're gonna like her and, and, and sort of want to be, be around her. She had a lot of like innate, uh, like I said, charm abilities and things like that, as well as the ability to, to inflict more powerful curses through mm -hmm. the bestow curse spell than, than the spell would normally uh, do. So that's another way I might change a monster, is have it uh, access to spells that are more powerful versions of what they might have to highlight a particularly powerful spellcaster or something like that. And so that was Razzle Sin. I, I needed a night hag who was also a powerful uh, supernatural figure. Mm -hmm. in that region, as someone who could plausibly uh, be like a demigod or something like that. And, and I think it, 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 it came off rather well uh, uh, for, for her. Uh, most definitely. I just realized <laughs> that uh, this weekend while we're shooting, uh, kind of having fun on Twitter, kind of created a monster that I want to use. What'd you do? Which is the mimic chest. Ah. That creates more mimics. It would be a chest that's a mimic, but yep. it, doesn't, it doesn't just attack the party uh -huh, like uh -huh. usual. It sits there, and maybe even it's like a chest of holding. 
You're right. It holds a hell of a lot more than usual. And when the players open it up, it is full of gold. Right. Right? And they're mm. like, well, shit, let's take this back. And so they take that chest full of gold back to town and start spinning that gold. Well, once the gold leaves the chest, it's like an egg. And about a week mm. later, that gold hatches. <laughs> and it is a mimic. It's the a gold mimic. itself is a mimic. So you can imagine the chaos that it would sow as the players move through town and start spending all this gold at places. And all of a sudden just mimic gold starts running right. around. This is the gold that those people brought. Right, right, And right. now they become villains. <laughs> yes. Because they're leaving this behind. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And any gold, anything you put in there becomes a mimic. And if you store it for X amount of time, once it's out for a week, it's a mimic now. There you go. And so, and that's the thing is it, it will never attack the party. Maybe unless it's completely empty. Completely and, empty and or, they, or they try to, to like destroy it or something. It, yeah, you, know. you try to destroy it. It would self-preservation. Yeah. But it, once it's empty for a while, maybe it starts to starve a little bit. Then it will attack something just to get something in it. Yeah. And yeah. then it sits dormant again. Like a mother <laughs> just waiting to give birth. Well, I like I really like that monster because it, it highlights that that sort of uh, line of, of conversation we were on when we were talking about like dungeons and mimics and and sort of the things that are found in dungeons and and if you think of like these D and D worlds as having anything like natural selection or an evolutionary process and and yet magic exists shape shifting type magic exists then you may have a monster that's like looks like ordinary manufactured objects that you know it needs to reproduce and how would it do that uh, other than finding ways to to get it out of the dungeon and into the larger world and, and mm-hmm. like I said it, calamity and, and havoc ensue yeah. yeah and so that's one of those where maybe you take the mimic and just modify it maybe you uh, go around and look for some other uh, abilities or, or something that that the uh, that the little coins can have. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> swarm of golden mimic coins, just <laughs> right. oh, exactly. Sort of some examples that we've had. I, I created a, a, a time traveling psychic wizard for uh, Land Between Two Rivers, uh, Lang the Immortal Chronomancer, and and he was a combination of, of some abilities that I found in uh, Tome of Beasts, the Kobold Press uh, uh, monster book that they had that inspired me, and then just sort of some of my own. What what should a Chronomancer be able to do? And I was like, he should be able to age a target. Target, right and, and hitting you with this sort of like mega beam of, of, of dark energy that, that does necrotic damage and, and potentially ages the target it's more more powerful versions of the time themed spells in uh, that are found in the uh, in the player's handbook so an example with that is you get a time stop but the time stop was like it stops time it, it doesn't just like make you really fast in this bubble his time stop was like I, I stopped it everybody this, all across the globe, this it, it, like my magic is is sort of that powerful, and that gives him a wider range of of, of what uh, what he can do uh, when that when that time is uh, is stopped, and, and so I, I I just sort of looked at what I wanted out of the monster, and, and you know it's kind of a caster, but I didn't want to have to deal with spell slots and other things like that, so I used mostly the die refresh mechanic, mm-hmm. or or was just like I don't care this you can cast slow as often as he wants, uh, <laughs> and, and and you know with with the realization that. Chances are that once these abilities start coming into play, it's going to be less than 10 rounds that they're going to be around. Yeah. And, and, and of course, Lang escapes using a, 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 a you know, makeshift uh, time machine uh, that they had, and uh, maybe we'll return to the party at some other point. There's other types that I've created. I've created a whole bunch of basilisks, and I was like, sometimes I want a basilisk that's like the size of a, a tiny lizard, and others want to be like these giant megalodon sort of, uh, you know, just nasty reptilian beasts. And maybe it does other things with its gaze attack. Instead of mm-hmm. petrification, it, it just like causes open sores to bleed or, or just like just starts to dissolve or disintegrate you with its gaze. Yeah. And and all of those are, are just variants. They all fit tight, you know, within the setting of Land Between Two Rivers. They're all, uh, you know, meant to be in that world and are embedded in that world with lore and, and, and and uh, you know a sense of place there, as opposed to just like oh, I, I guess I'll include it because it's in the monster manual. Um, and so I, you know, I, it, was, it was kind of like mm-hmm. talked a lot about these. I, I think that the the big takeaway for homebrew monsters is to not sweat it. Yeah, 
is to just uh, find what you think is going to be interesting about a custom monster, whether it's a tiny tweak to an existing one or a full-blown, I'm going to go all out with the layer actions and the regional effects and legendary actions and all of this custom spells. And, and you just want to like wow your players with with original content from your from your brain that fits perfectly for your campaign setting. Um, the, the big thing is to is to just do it. And and if you mess up, if you create something that's uh, way outclasses your uh, you know your party that you're that you're running against, then give it a my bad and try again later. And if it was a disaster, then it's you know just talk through it and. Uh, you know the, the fun of this game is creating something for it uh, that that really fits and is really uh, perfect for what you need, and uh, you know then the secondary part of that is getting to share it and mm -hmm. and having other people take enjoyment out of uh, out of what you thought up. So uh, yeah, that's why we uh, definitely love uh, homebrew monsters as well as other uh, content. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> you monster! Head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more. WebDM is also on Twitch with three weekly games, Starward Bound, Unearthly Twilights, and Land Between Two Rivers, which we upload to WebDM Plays, our second YouTube channel. Well, they go flush. Oh, well, totally. You can get them all so that they're completely flush. I mean, there's nothing stopping you as a DM from just going. Yeah, I mean, like if I was using this as a, as a screen. Why don't you take a selfie of me putting makeup okay. on for it? Uh. Wait, did you did you talk about me in the third person to me? Mm -hmm. I talked about me in the third person to you so that you can... My head hurts. No, no, you said, will you go ahead and take a selfie of me you putting did. makeup on Pruitt? You did. You did. But it's a selfie of you with but, me in it. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, no, you're right. On Pruitt. Oh, yeah. okay. Yes, I'm very confused.